how it feels to watch episode 6 of Helluva Boss. I was going for a feeling. How does one talk about this? Like, how does one form the mouth words after witnessing what I have just witnessed? I mean, when Vizzy and crew took some extra time to work on Hell of a Boss Season 6, I had no problem with it. Take your time, add some polish, make it look all nice for the people. But I don't think anyone saw this coming. I mean, not only did Spindle Horse polish this piece so much that the Sheen could blind aliens in another galaxy, but the sheer amount of ambition they put into this thing, the amount of unexpected twists and turns they took us along for, it just boggles the mind on countless levels. Boggle. We went from impressive visuals for an indie project, to I'm convinced that Vivzi has some kind of money embezzlement scheme on the side to afford this level of quality. We went from emotions that left us curled up in front of our computers, to insert Metal Gear Solid meme here. We went from simple but fun and fast-paced action to, well, for lack of a better word, boom, bang, boom, da, ba, ba, da, 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 boom, da, boom, bang, 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 boom, da, boom, Yeah, I think that sums it up. I can say with complete confidence that I've never been more engaged, entertained, and impressed with a Vivzy Pop animation in my life. And I know most of you are probably sick of hearing that since I say it in almost every video, but I can't help the fact that her team keeps raising the bar every time they make something. Heck, with only two episodes left in the supposed Big Four, and the quality steadily increasing, I honestly expect the season finale to be a full-fledged Disney-quality musical with an all-star cast and A-list animators across the board. In any other review, that would be a joke, but I think Vivzy might actually consider it given what we've seen so far. Beauty and the black. But we'll tackle that whenever it comes around, because right now I'm in the mood to gush. There are some amazing things in this episode, and I'm sure you all want to hear a full breakdown of the episode that made me break down. So let's do it. Put on your sunglasses indoors as I hotbox your rooms with some sweet, sweet truths. It's time for Hell of a Boss Episode 6, Truth Seekers. So the episode starts off with a pair of men in black looking guys who shoot the expositional breeze while surrounded by clips from previous episodes. Man, you know your show is good when even your characters want to binge it. Not to mention watching multiple episodes at a time. Now that's dedication. These two fellas who go by Agent 1 and Agent 2 are members of the D-H-O-R-K-S, or Dorks. Yeah, I get it. They're basically a group that make it their mission to expose demon activity to the masses through hard evidence while trying to look as badass as possible. And thanks to IMP being as inconspicuous as an American tourist in a foreign country, they have a lot to work with. Yeah, I think we pretty much all saw this coming. I mean, IMP's idea of being sneaky is Bugs Bunny level espionage at best, and literally nothing at worst. So them getting caught by humans was bound to happen eventually. And the fact that it's these guys that caught them in the act is probably the worst luck in the world. I mean, on the surface, they don't seem that dangerous, while with the overreactions and the crazy accents and the less than intelligent weapon choices. But trust me, these guys could very well be the most dangerous enemies that IMP has ever ticked off. Because as we'll see later, they may just have the resources and connections to completely screw over not just IMP, but the entirety of Hell itself. Yup, the demonic forces of the underworld exposed to the masses, thanks to two sharply dressed schmoes from Yonkers. Now that's storytelling right there. Smile, you're a dork! Anyway, the agents quickly locate Blitz and the gang, thanks to Blitz's zero stealth skills. Remember, we can't be seen. And after a decent alleyway chase scene, Blitz and Mox are swiftly captured, taken to Dork's HQ, and interrogated for information. And the rest of the episode involves the two of them growing closer as they trip out on truth gas, while the IMP girls go on a covert ops mission to break the boys out of danger. I'm gonna start this list of good things off with the biggest and most obvious positive. In my opinion, this is the first hell of a boss episode to truly achieve perfect balance. When I reviewed the other five episodes, there was always at least one element that I thought was a little bit lacking. Spring Broken was hilarious, but had a pretty broken story. Cherub had a unique style, but it was extremely repetitive. 
Heck, even the almighty Lululand had some lackluster comedy in my eyes. But with Truth Seekers, I have almost nothing to say. It's just firing on all cylinders when it comes to comedy, drama, and action. Not only do these aspects get their own designated moment to shine, like the interrogation scene for comedy, the crazy trip out sequence for drama, and the action scenes for action, but they're not isolated to those moments either. There are tons of times when the crew try to work in a joke or a cute moment into a scene where you're not expecting it, and they always nail it. They never grind the scene to a screeching halt just to reach a quota or something. It always flows and feels so natural. Like, these are just things that the characters would do here. Like, of course Blitz would praise Luna for her fighting skills. Of course Millie would chop up a bunch of guys and then skip away like a little girl. Of course Blitz would take a selfie with a severed head, now available on Instagram. Of course Blitz would find a way to fit profanities into an emotional song. Of course Blitz would have a rocket launcher named after his private! And of course the first place that Blitz would be spotted was at a horse farm, complete with the camera paused on the worst possible shot of him. I just love when shows do that. Comedy gold every time. I'm just so glad to see an episode where all of this show's strengths are used to their fullest. And no matter what tone they try to capture, it always feels like hell of a boss. It never loses the charm or personality that we've come to love. And I think that's super important. But trust me, we're just getting started. Allow me to go over the three standout scenes that I mentioned before and further prove to you why this episode is astounding. Just gonna pretend you didn't see that and off we go! Case A, the interrogation scene. This part is pretty much just three minutes of classic hell of a boss comedy. You got Blitz and Moxie tied up in a room with these two guys who think they're at their mercy, but the imp duel managed to break them down bit by bit thanks to smugness and expert level trolling. And not only is this scene drop dead hilarious, but it also shows off an interesting thing about this show's style of humor. Hell of a Boss thrives on its back and forth banter. Some of its funniest moments are just characters bouncing off each other in amazing ways. And because of this, intentional or not, it actually manages to take some of the most bland side characters and make them somewhat memorable. Like, I don't think it's controversial to say that characters like Verasica and the Cherubs and even the Dork Agents are definitely on the weaker side. They got a couple interesting things, like Verasica has her cotton candy bombshell design, and the Cherubs have their adorable blue sheep that they treat like a black sheep, but for the most part, there's not much about them that stands out. And yet, when they're given the chance to talk to Blitz and the gang, they become part of some of the funniest scenes in their respective episodes. Moments that immediately stick out in my mind and help me to remember them better. It's like some of IMP's endless charm suddenly rubs off on them. And whether they're overreacting or biting back, they instantly have a scene that helps them stand out in my mind. It's rare that you see a style of comedy that can make any character memorable, but Hell of a Boss pulls it off perfectly. Also, I don't think I made it clear enough in my other videos, but Richard Horvitz's voice just bleeds comedy. I mean, Brandon Rogers is always awesome, he does a great job as Blitz, and he's one of the only guys I know that can make constant profanity somewhat funny, but Richard Horvitz just always manages to be hilarious, no matter what situation he's placed in. In fact, you know that old phrase, he could make the phone book funny? Well, here's Mr. Horvitz just reading out an overly detailed Starbucks order, and yet it had me in tears. I'll have a Neapolitan cappuccino, more cappa than chino. Make sure it's got no more than four ounces of milk. The beans won't have the right texture otherwise. And make sure they spell my name correctly on the cup. They always put Foxy or Roxy. I hate that. If you can't handle that, I'll have a venti traditional misto. Please use soy milk with two blonde shots, affogato and ristretto. I'd also love three vanilla pumps at the very bottom, then add the coffee after. We serve food here, sir. But their trolling doesn't last forever as Agents 1 and 2 hear their plans from the other side and decide to drop a literal truth bomb on them, leading to Case B, the freaky trip out sequence. And seeing as Agent 2 is voiced by Sapphire from Steven Universe, I can think of no better time to play this song. It's the truth, it's the truth, it's the truth, kind of love. This scene is immaculate. It is without hesitation one of the most ambitious and overall best things that Hell of a Boss has ever done. An emotional bombshell of epic proportions. It's kind of weird saying that because this episode didn't exactly do any big reveals per se. Everything we see in this scene is something that's been front and center in an episode already, like Moxie's insecurities and Blitz's loneliness. We've already known for a while that the show has had a winning hand it's been waiting to play, and this scene is basically just the show laying those emotional cards on the table and telling us to read them and weep. And in the end, we were all weeping. Because the execution here was so fantastic. 
The incredible fusion of different animation styles, the well-composed music, the simultaneous direct and indirect visual storytelling, they just threw all their effort into this five minutes and it shows so much. But don't just take my word for it, let's analyze both halves, starting with Moxie. Moxie gets a super classic Disney style of animation for his trip, while paying homage to Phantom of the Opera. The funny thing about this is that Disney's never done a version of Phantom of the Opera before. Yeah, they own half the planet at this point, and they've never touched arguably one of the most well-known pieces of musical theater ever. I like to imagine that this whole sequence is just Vipsy fulfilling a secret dream of hers. Anyway, the animation itself is super freaking clean and slick and extremely faithful to the old style of classic hand-drawn Disney. I mean, just look at scenes like this and this. It's so smooth. Mmm, it's so smooth. It's like covering a street in fresh asphalt. And tile and butter and lard and Stryker's dialogue. So smooth! I come from a die-hard Disney family and we've seen all the movies a billion times. So watching someone emulate this style this well just made me so freaking happy. But the visuals are more than just a style here as they perfectly line up with Moxie's personality and also his core problem. Moxie's biggest fault is that he cares way too much about what people think. He'll often go out of his way to change things about himself or refrain from speaking his mind just because he's scared of rejection, as we've seen in many episodes. In fact, I'm sure the main reason that he's always so focused on having Millie around, aside from the fact that he loves her and who would blame him, is that she's one of the only people who he's completely opened up to and who accepts every aspect about him. She's one of the few people who he knows won't reject him, and therefore he feels more comfortable whenever she's around. But Blitz from the first day he met him saw so much worth in Moxie, more worth than he sees himself. He gave him that compliment because he actually does believe in him and thinks that he's both a crack shot and a class act. But as he spent more time with Moxie, he starts to realize how desperate he is for acceptance from others and probably thought, all right, this little weasel has no faith in his abilities. Something's gotta be done about this. And this resulted in Blitz turning up the tough love and being a lot harder and more judgmental of Moxie. He basically pulled a reverse psychology and threw all of Moxie's doubts right in his face, saying that he does suck, he is terrible, he isn't worthwhile, in the hopes that Moxie will eventually start to push back and realize that all those doubts were simply not true. And if Moxie can stand his ground against such an in-your-face judgmental jerk, he can stand his ground against anyone else. He can be confident in himself no matter what others think. And if they don't accept him, well, tough toenails, because that's just who he is. And while it's clear that this technique has worked in episodes like Harvest Moon Festival, Moxie still needed that one final push to really get himself out of the self-defeating sludge. And this trip was the push he needed. Moxie's whole scene takes place on this long candlelit staircase. It curves and twists and turns, but it still ends at one location. And as Moxie climbs it, he becomes more and more honest about what he thinks of Blitz and himself. This perfectly symbolizes what Moxie has to do to fix his problem. He has to speak his mind. He has to be confident in what he says and what he does. It's not going to be easy and it might take a while to get there, hence the path not being straight, but it will ultimately end in happiness for everyone. His close friends will be happy to know the real him, and Moxie will be happy to be the real him. It's such a potent and meaningful scene that perfectly sums up Moxie's character. And when you throw in those gorgeous strokes on piano, which is one of the greatest instruments of all time, fight me, you get one of the most beautiful things to ever come out of Hell of a Boss. As for Blitz's half... Oh man, where do I even start with this? Simply put, Blitz's entire sequence involves his subconscious putting him on blast. Just being thrashed and pelted and flung around mercilessly by tortured visions of his past, all taking place in this bizarre hellscape of oozing textures, melding art styles, and zero clear structure. This isn't a mutual two-sided duet like in Moxie's scene. This is just pain, fear, and confusion incarnate. A complete mental breakdown in visual form. And while Blitz's backstory isn't directly shown here, there is a lot that you can take away from this scene. It's obvious from what we're shown here and from hints throughout the series that Blitz's view on love and his faith in love have been completely skewed. His entire life from his beginnings as a circus performer to his current job as an assassin has just been a never-ending stream of love-related failures that have further drilled the idea into his head that he is incapable of being loved by anyone. Sometimes these things were caused by fate, sometimes by the actions of others, and sometimes just because of his own doubts due to past experiences. 
and in the present day he's become so cold, distant, and jaded that he tries to push away anyone that he thinks he's getting too close to, under the impression that it's never gonna last. I mean, what's the point? Eventually everyone leaves, right? That's the idea that he's accepted as fact, and that's just the way his life is going to be forever. And yet despite all of his past experiences, deep deep down, he still knows that life doesn't have to be this way. He knows this way of thinking is wrong. He knows this doesn't have to be true. He knows that he still wants to be loved even with everything in life telling him he can't be. But he continues to push these truths as far back into his mind as possible, still having zero faith in himself and his future. But once he gets a whiff of the truth gas, it's impossible to hold it back anymore. All these repressed thoughts and memories come flooding into his conscious mind without stop. All the people that Blitz met during these moments in his life start speaking in his own voice, proving that as much as he tries to deny it, he knows that this is all true. He knows that this distant way of living is just a boneheaded way of repressing what he really wants and desires, but he's repressed these thoughts for so long that when they finally do come back, his mind has no idea how to handle them. It's just veritable chaos and melting concepts all around him as he's constantly beat to hell. For years, these thoughts have just been left to fester and rot and... God, please don't eat that! You don't know how long that's been there! But even amongst all the chaos is a little bit of hope. Because he knows that if he actually opened himself up to the people that he's currently close to, like Moxie and Stolas, he might finally achieve the love that he's been after. He could finally be happy. He could finally be accepted. Heck, if he's lucky, he might even get seven minutes in heaven. Eh? I've got a whole video planned where I break down this scene further and even try to map out all of Blitz's failures with love, but that's for another day. For now, I'm just gonna say that Blitz's whole sequence is a phenomenal use of twisted animation to present a character's twisted views on love and his self-worth, and it's absolutely fantastic. And as a nice breather after all that madness, when the gas finally clears and the duo are back in the real world, we get this wonderful moment of the two of them just talking in silence, taking to heart what they went through in their drug-fueled hallucinations, and just being completely truthful with each other. There's not much I can mention about this scene other than the fact that I love it. Quiet scenes where two characters just casually talk often make for some of my favorite scenes in movies and TV, and this is no different. And capping it all off with Blitz insisting that Moxie use his real name instead of just saying sir is just such a nice way to show that they really have grown closer over this experience. They change for the better, and we were there for the insane ride. Just fantastic. But that's enough time for Mushy Sentiment because Millie and Luna are here for the rescue, leading to the third and final part of the episode, KC The Action Scenes. This is a part of the episode that really doesn't need much explanation. If you thought that Moxie's bad trip was an excuse for the animators to flex on us, well, it was, but this is an even bigger one. Multiple minutes in this episode are just dedicated to IMP wrecking shop and slaughtering tons of no-name baddies, and it looks spectacular. They use a huge assortment of weapons and techniques, leading to tons of variety in every scene. The pace never slows down, leading to just non-stop adrenaline pumping insanity. They work 3D animation in perfectly with these 360 shots. Shout out to Chaos Emporium Mink for their awesome job on these, by the way. And like I said before, they expertly wove in jokes and dialogue that add so much personality to the fight and perfectly show off everyone's strengths and fighting styles. Luna's a hellhound, so she tears into people with her teeth. And even though she brushes off Blitz's public affections, she does still make a clear effort to protect him here, which is adorable. Millie's petite, but she hits like a truck. And she's definitely strong enough to lift this gigantic battle axe because we saw her open a mouth of a kaiju fish back in Spring Broken. Moxie's a master of ranged combat, and even when he screws up, he always finds a way to make things right, just like we saw in Murder Family. And not only does Blitz get a moment with each of his employees, showing that he really is willing to open up more to others, but we get further proof that he's a master of every weapon under the sun, from knives to guns to his own bare fists, and he makes sure to always bring plenty of tools with him on the job. Again, this guy carries around a gigantic rocket launcher named after his- Johnson! Like, what else can I say? Also, I gotta give credit to these scenes for showing that despite all of IMP's stupid decisions, they are an extremely formidable army when push comes to shove. Like, these guys are one demon foursome you do not want to mess with. Remind me again how many Agent Smith weebs they killed during these action scenes? Da 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 da
And just when you thought things couldn't get any more awesome, our favorite pansexual Big Bird shows up and scares the colonic contents right out of Agents 1 and 2, leading to probably the scariest scene that Vivzi and company have ever produced. It's weird, right? So many shows about demons, and yet this is probably the first true horror scene that they've ever done. But they completely sell it, with the eerie line delivery, the exorcist-style head turning, and the insanely creepy design of Stolas' true form. Yeah, this guy may be a submissive little dove in the bedroom, but when you look at the Underworld leaderboard, he is still extremely high up there, and scenes like this make it clear why that is. So in the end, it looks like everything managed to work out in this episode. Blitz is more open, Moxie's more direct, the team came out mostly unscathed, the Stolitz shippers are having a field day, everything looks good to me. But uh-oh, wait a minute, Stolitz allowed Agents 1 and 2 to live, and like every secret agency ever, they have hidden cameras everywhere, meaning that they captured live footage of demons that they could use to expose them to the world. Oopsie boopsie! In all honesty though, this scene is actually pretty foreboding. I mean, we're never exactly told what dorks is. Are they a well-known branch of the government like the FBI or the CIA? Are they a secret hush-hush syndicate like the Men in Black? Are they some kind of privately owned corporation that has no direct ties to the government? Honestly, they could be anything. But I like to think that they have at least some kind of government connections. And if that's true, this footage could be a one-way ticket to a worldwide revolution against hell. I mean, think about it. This footage is shown to the president, they show him even more proof so that it checks out, all the world leaders are notified, armies upon armies are established for protection, and when the demons inevitably show up again, there are guns at the ready every which way to take them out. Or maybe even specialized units that are willing to invade the portals they open up to take the fight straight to hell's home turf. I mean, we've seen demons enter the human realm plenty of times, but we've never seen humans enter the demon realm. And the funny thing is, they might actually stand a chance in some cases. I mean, most lower class demons like imps, hellhounds, and sinners can be taken down by any normal firearm. Except flamethrowers, I guess. Those are gonna have to stay at home. But yeah, a fully stocked army can probably tear through most of hell with ease. As for the more dangerous high class demons, there are ways around that too. I imagine that a team of highly stealthy humans could scope out the black market in hell and swipe a bunch of heavenly weapons for their own use. Plus, there's also a certain trio of heavenly baboos that I'm sure would love to get revenge on the demons that cost them their home and their job. Again, topic for another video, but I can totally see humanity becoming a threat if the right info gets to the right people. But that's not all, because not only does dorks have footage of real-life demons, but they also have footage of all of IMP's strengths, weaknesses, and relationships. Meaning that with better preparedness, when IMP returns to Earth once again, they could easily strike an emotional blow to any of the main characters by using their loved ones as bait. I could totally see a series of exchanges where dorks not only gets to torture the demons that demolish their whole agency, but possibly even get their hands on IMP's most powerful keepsake, the Grimoire. <laughs> oh man, if humanity gets their hands on that book, everyone is screwed. Our main characters are screwed, Stolas is screwed, Hell is screwed, it would just be a disaster. And the saddest part of all, Blitz would have to deal with the fact that this is partially his fault. The first time he decides to really open up to the ones he loves, and it can be used as the greatest weapon against them. If someone doesn't hug this sad clown, I'm gonna reach through the computer screen and do it myself. Oh, and also, there are no negatives this time around. I mean, I could question why Stolas and IMP didn't just kill the two agents, why they didn't double check any security cameras for footage, why the agents are so excited to have footage of demons when they already have plenty of footage at the beginning of the episode, and why they need footage in the first place when IMP was already caught on public television in the pilot, but honestly, I don't care. I enjoyed this episode far too much to even bother with that much nitpicking, and even if I did, it wouldn't ruin what was otherwise an absolutely stellar episode. So there you go, a thorough breakdown of this masterpiece of internet animation. I didn't even have to say anything else. Spindle Horse has absolutely outdone themselves. And the fact that we get this level of quality in visuals, storytelling, and comedy for practically free still baffles me to this day. The action had my blood pumping, the song had my feet thumping, the emotions had my heart bumping. After this episode, these two probably started humping. It was just a completely enjoyable experience all around. 
and when you pile on all the ambitious aspects like the insane camera work and implemented 3D during the action, the stylistic duality of the two-tone trippy musical number, and the risky 22-minute runtime that could have easily felt overly long, you have further proof as to why Vivzi, Brandon, their animators, editors, cleanup artists, storyboarders, composers, songwriters, musicians, and everybody else involved deserves all the respect in the world. It's clear from Vivzi's two-week delaying of the episode and the sheer magnitude of the final product that she believes in making her content as good as it can possibly be. A delayed but good product is way better than a rushed but sloppy product, and I completely respect this mindset because it's the same one I follow with my content. Trust me, I wish I could release two to three videos a week like every other person in the fandom, but I always find myself just adding that extra little bit or that one extra joke just because I think it would make the video so much better. I want to release stuff not only that you guys can enjoy, but that I can also be proud of. And seeing that Vivzi and company follow the exact same mindset just makes me so happy. And you can't argue with the results. They not only have a diehard fan support, but they also have a fellow creator's respect. Sorry Lululand, you had a good run, but it's time to bow down to the new king. Truth Seekers is officially my new favorite episode of Hell of a Boss. The action is more plentiful, the emotions hit harder, the comedy is sharper, and while You Will Be Okay is still my favorite song in the series, Moxie's Bad Trip is easily my new favorite musical number. When you take the music, visuals, and narrative details into account. They've officially shattered our future expectations for the third time in six episodes, and I think it goes without saying that this episode was totally worth the wait. And speaking of worth the wait, thank you guys so much for being patient with me. Like I said, my stuff takes way longer to come out than everybody else's, but I do hope that the extra effort is worth it. We're almost to 50k subs, and I definitely couldn't have made it this far without all of your help. So stay tuned and stay awesome. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go work on my next theory where I try to decipher what the heck dorks could stand for. Hmm. Demon hunters of ruthless killer status. Nah, that's too awesome. Demon hunting organization revealing kept secrets. Nah, too clever. Dope havers of really cool suits? Ugh, this is gonna take a while.